Welcome to Facebook Live here in the Brownell Studios. I'm Steve Ostrom, and with me today I have two very special guests. I have Bobby Tyler here from Tyler Gunworks in Texas, and Tom Lum from Cedar Knolls Gunworks in Missouri. And if they look familiar, it's because Bobby is on your current Brownells catalog, Tom was on last year's catalog, and of course the best looking guy was on the year before that. And we're here to talk about gun collecting, gunsmithing, gun restoration, and everything you want to talk about. So if you want to leave us a comment, we'll get to your question as soon as we can. Bobby, let's start off with you. You've been in this business how long now? I've been in the industry since 99. 99. And you've been? Full time since 05. 05. So, and I've been kind of playing at this for, since the 90s, was when I got serious about it. So between us, we've been doing it quite a while. Learned a few tricks. You guys Still both are, are uh, incurable gun collectors, right? More than I'd like to be sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So just generally, what's the collector's market doing right now? What's happening? I see good quality guns. That's where it's at. You know, good quality, honest guns. Have, have people know. stopped buying AR-15s just long enough to accumulate some of the older stuff? I see a huge comeback in, in good old revolvers, uh, Smiths, Rugers, Colts. Um, yeah. Seems like the revolver market to me is, is really high right now. That's kind of a soft spot for me. I really yeah. like my Smiths and uh, the occasional Colts okay too. Yeah. And you, you even do Rugers. Pin barrel Smith & Wesson's uh, old model Rugers, the old three screw as they call them. You know, stuff that doesn't have to be worth a fortune, but it's good quality and you, it's a good platform if you want to make something on it. Worth a fortune. Why is a Colt Python worth what they're bringing now? Can anybody explain that to me? Not me. C-O-L-T. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Just like right. the single actions, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Even the Diamondbacks and the Anacondas have gone way up in price. I think it's all about the little pony. I think so, too. You know, the little pony's cool. Well, even the little pocket automatics, you know, the uh, the 0332s, they've gone up to where, you know, I would think twice about buying one and shooting it if it was in yeah. nice shape. I wouldn't want to scratch it anymore. And the 380s are even worse. The 380s have always been more. Right. Because, but the 32s were hard to get rid of at one time. I remember having them on my show at, uh, gu my table at gun shows, trying to get rid of a 32 and you couldn't do it. That new movie that just came out is really going to help that market as well. The Highwaymen. Oh, yeah. Get yeah, ready. I'd forgotten get about ready. that. Yeah, better get, get your... Uh, I think we're on the wrong side of the curve. We yeah. Just, <laughs> it's, it's pretty safe to say, though, if you buy something marked Colt, you're going to be okay yeah. in the future. I mean, nothing seems to go down in, in value. Even the little 22s, yeah. the little scouts and, and things. And in a world right now where it's so hard to find a good place to put investment, guns are solid. They are. You know, buy good guns, take good care of them, enjoy them, shoot them. Keep them clean, and your investment stays. That's the way I look at my Smith & Wesson collection, yeah. because I do, I do shoot a lot of them, and it doesn't hurt the value. They're, they're used when I get them, so. Right. There's I a big market for, for guns that are usable, but still collectible. Not everybody can afford or wants to buy guns that they can only look at. Right. And, and in the, that middle range market where you can go in and get some really nice stuff or have some custom work done, send it to Bobby, get really nice case color, that's still going to add to the value of the gun, but it's usable. If you buy a first generation Colt single action and you spend ten or $20,000, you're not taking it to the range. No. And there's no. a lot of people that aren't interested in that. That's but true. Good stuff yeah. is always good stuff. And junk is always I mean, junk. I, I've, yeah. I've watched guns being bought and sold where the, where the seller will say, well, this doesn't actually work. And the buyer will say, I don't care. <laughs> it's right. an old Colt. It's a first yeah. generation or whatever. They don't care. I've had buyers, the, the first question I ask is, did you check the bore? Because, you know, early steel, early, early ammunition sure. and the components, they would, they would destroy a bore. And I've had people say, I don't care what the bore looks like. I've had and that too. And, I, and I'm like, if the bore yeah. is bad, 50% of your value yeah. is gone. But there are people that buy guns by appearance only. I would not suggest that, by the way. Yeah, that's the, right. that's the veins that pumps the blood, you know? Yeah. You know, the right. bore, you, you got to have a good bore. True. Now, Winchester, just like Colt, doesn't seem to lose value. On the long gun side, if you've got an old lever action gun, Winchester made, you know, in the early 1900s or something, or even a pre-64 Model 70, yeah. It seems like they just keep going up through the roof. Well, they go up, they go down. I, I've seen Winchesters take a dip three different times, mm -hmm. but they will stabilize and they'll come back. 
So if you have Winchesters right now and you paid a whole lot for them and you're like, wow, it's down, this particular model is down, yeah. hang on to it. It'll come back. Don't, don't sell on. it. Uh, model 70s are very strong right now. They are. You know, the early ones. They are, especially in the odd calibers. Oh, yeah. Which would be what, 22 Hornet? 257 Roberts. Even a 300 H&H is worth quite a bit. Right. Now. A quite desirable gun, just for somebody that wants to hunt with one. Yeah, yeah. other than your 30 out 6 and 270, which are most common, everything else has a, has a decent premium, and some have a lot. Right, right. So. One well, thing I've noticed on the long gun versus handguns, a lot of guys typically will take more collecting in handguns because they're easier to care for and they take up less space. And I've seen some guys that were, they're buying for investment purposes that typically would buy handgun after handgun and sure. occasionally come into that long gun, but they just take a little bit more space and a little more care right. as far as getting in and out of a safe or banging a barrel, getting a dent in one of them 20 gauge barrels or something coming out of a safe. Sure. And, and there are people that are collecting firearms as an investment. They're not, right. they're not gun people. Right. They just said, this is a good, stable market. And, and that happens a lot. Somebody will say, tell me what I need to buy in the $2,500 range or the $1,000 mm -hmm. range, whatever yeah. range it is, that something that if I hang on to for, for a while, that it's a good investment. And they don't even know. They're taking your word for it. Well, buy this. Right. This, this will appreciate yeah. at some point. Right. So. The market's changed quite a bit. Yes, it has. Now, where I'm at in Missouri, the AR market is flat. It's, it's not that great, you know, across the board. I mean, people still are assembling ARs, but now right. they're looking for something different. Like our retro line, for example, that took off because they were so different. And everybody would like an example of the old early AR-10 or the M-15 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we, we've got pretty close clones to where they look, look and feel just like the originals did. Right. right. So that, that was a market we, you know, I didn't expect to take off like it did, and it really did. It Anything really that you can get out and, and produce it as a retro of something else. Right. Like we were talking earlier, you have your ups and downs, and right. what goes around comes around, you know? It's amazing what comes back. Yeah. Uh, and, and everything is new because the, the young people coming up weren't around 40 years ago yeah. reading the articles of 40 years ago, so it's new to them. We were talking about the old Elmer Keith looking revolvers. 44 Special. 44 Special, number right. five grip frame. That, uh, the, the king mirror front sight. If you haven't seen it, folks, uh, this is one of Bobby's guns. Uh, uh, it's absolutely gorgeous, and uh, I, I like to call these type of guns custom classic. It's a classic firearm, but it's, it's beautifully customized with barrel and sights grips it's been color cased by bobby and uh it's just gorgeous and you can take it and you can use it and shoot it and this will this will become you know more valuable as time goes on so you can still use it it's not something that's a hundred years old that you're afraid to use it because it's going to detract from its value but uh this is a good market right now to be and it's people that want an older gun that were made really well but want to uh but want to like clean it up a little bit or do something a little bit fancy, add some sights or something, and you can do that without destroying the value of a lot of these guns. Anyway, Nostalgia, you know, just right. like, for instance, the sight. Uh, you know, back in the 20s and 30s, King did this sight with this mirror that reflects off of the bead. Right. And Which adds light so you can actually see that's it right. a lot better. You know, when you start to get over that certain age marker where the eyes start to fail you a little bit. There's certain things that people have done over the years that's been successful or unsuccessful. And this is one that I think you'll be seeing a lot more of in the future. Uh, there's a, basically, a, there's a guy that set up building these out of Texas. And he, he's building these style, you know, various different styles of front sights. But this, this king style of right. a mirror front sight is, is extremely popular. And still relevant. Years it, later. it worked then. Yeah. It works right. now. Yeah. Now, yeah. is this one of your, one of your uh, more favorite guns to work on as a single action Ruger? You know, we're kind of getting a reputation for the guy who works on single action Rugers, and I don't mind that reputation, other than the fact that we work on a lot of different guns. You know, single action, double action, uh, but I do, yes, and, and I sure don't mind. Uh, it's it's not a bad bad thing to to have said about you and and we oh. do it because we enjoy it and the ruger's a great platform to they customize. are you know these 
especially since Lipsy's came out with oh yeah you know all the different different uh, Lipsy's exclusive models where yes. they've gone into basically they've studied the old Elmer Keith Skeeter mm -hmm. Skelton yep. all the old loads what's what what does the guy out there want yep. the, the end product and they probably and, ask, and they've you know, brought what are guys like Bobby Tyler getting calls on what are they that's right what do they want built and if and if some of you younger viewers haven't heard of Hamilton Bowen when he wrote a book a few years back on the book of the revolver, he did a ton of this type of stuff and did beautiful, beautiful work. If you have a chance to find that book or, or read yeah, it. The custom revolver. The cus that's what it was, yeah. custom revolver. Yeah. I've Just got a signed copy stuff. of that at the house. I still take it out and look at it. Mine's not signed. Maybe uh, I'll have one at my house by the time I get home. Uh, could happen. <laughs> could happen. It's out of Maybe. print. It's out of print. Yeah, well. yeah. Available in digital copy, though. Really? He does have digital yeah. copies available. Not the hmm. same as turning a page. Not the same. Not the same. Yeah. Nope. Not kicking back in your chair and right. turning those pages. Yep. Exactly. Drinking just coffee. <laughs> yeah. So ones that we set up like this, we go in and we tune we tune the action. We do the the hammer, the trigger, all the mm -hmm. small details that when you when you finally get time to get off work and go to the range, you want that time to be flawless. Quality, right. Quality time. And so Two and a half pound trigger pull. Uh, take the creep out. Actually time it. Figure out if it's fast or slow and time it appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, the octagon barrel, that was a, a nice twist. This is one that I'm going to be shooting out at the Shooter's Holiday in June oh, out at nice. Raton at nice. the Whittington Center. You'll be shooting briquettes off the And off we the will be shooting it. minimum of 25 yards. Yeah. You know, you don't. There's, is there a there, minimum caliber no to enter? There's no seven yard, <laughs> seven yard shooting where I'm going to be shooting. So. Uh, and that's why we, we took the time to, to set the sights up right. The sights aren't, aren't just put, put on there, you know. They're, they're a certain height to fit that gun. Who made the rear sight? That's a Hamilton Bowen. Okay. It is. And the front sight, the, the guy's name is Furman Garza. He's okay. out, and he's out of uh, near Corpus area down, down in the bottom of Texas. Do you prefer the, the new model or the old model on Lucas? <coughs> or does it matter? You know, that's, that's a, a debate all its own. Right. Um, in building these kind of guns that you're going to get out and really push and, and change on, I'm a traditionalist at heart. And so I like to take the new models and build on. Of course, we've built some old models lately too, but those old models are getting fewer and fewer. They are. And, and they're not cheap like they used to be either. You know, and at some point in time, why not embrace the industry? They've gone to a lot of trouble to bring these out. Why not embrace the industry, buy it, c do it th on this, and keep the original old model in the safe? And for the I've, consumer. I've done that with my Smith & Wessons. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, my 586 that I've had on, on one of these uh, from the vaults is my favorite revolver to shoot. And I can push anything through there, and I don't worry about it going out of time or anything because that thing's built like a tank. Right. And my new 44 is one of the new ones with a lock on it. So it's got the better heat treating and everything in it. It'll hold anything I put in there, and it'll do it much longer than a 29-2 will. But 29-2 can stay in the vault, stay nice, but pristine. Can we, put, can we put a pin in the barrel, though? Sure, we can okay. put a pin in there. Okay, That's yeah. not a problem. So the pin barrel recess cylinder thing, right. you know? Right. If you're a collector, it's a big deal. And, and people jump up and down on it. Yeah. Yes, they do. But three T's. You, you know get what the three T's are? Target stocks, target hammer, and target sights. Isn't that right? Did trigger. I get that right? Trigger. Trigger, yeah. Trigger. trigger. Yeah, the big right. wide That's right. target trigger. And then the stocks are noted somewhere else on the box, right? Right. Yeah. I always get that one messed up. Well, you know, if you, you create an extra expense for the consumer, if he's going to send a gun to you, he wants a really nice custom gun. Now, if he wants an old model, that's going to be more expense. It's going to be harder to find, probably cost a little more money. Um, so well, you're right. Parts it, can it, be it, tough. You can well, just like your grip frame. I mean... This, this one has the two-piece power custom grip frame, and they do make it for an old model. They do make it for a new model, but, you know, the, the trigger return spring that's inside the... Right. Well, with the plunger. It, you know, it just, there's certain difficulties that you have to embrace when you make that decision, and it does cost more to, to do this to an old model than it right. is a new model, just because there's more... More labor. The first custom gun I ever had b before I got into this profession was I, I read an article that Hamilton Bowen had been, had been written about him in one of the gun magazines. And uh, so I made a trip down to visit him in Tennessee in like 98 and uh, brought my old 
old model three screw. If you folks don't, a lot of you may not understand the difference, but if you look at a new model, it has two pins on the side of the receiver. The earlier guns had three th screws and it did not have a transfer bar safety in the back. That's the difference. Well, Hamilton, at least at that time, really, really liked working on the old models and I liked them as well. So sure enough, I went and found an old model and down it went. Mm. And uh, mm. so, but they haven't made them since 70 something, two, somewhere a in there. Long time. There's, a long there's time. been a lot of changes too right. and a lot of it's yeah. safety related, sure. you know. And sure. uh, you know, as, as we learn more, we have to make changes. But you're right, the technology, the metal today, everything, I mean, these guns are built like a bank vault. Right. They and, and, and the grip frame they come with now, though, the small X3 uh, grip frame. Right. It's yep. very comfortable for me, even though I've got big hands, right. just like a Colt single action. Well, see, they offer it in, in that grip frame and mm -hmm. also in the Bisley. Yep. Which is, which is, is similar to this. The Bisley is a little, has a little more curvature. This is right. the traditional Elmer Keith number five. And so there's a little variance between it and the Bisley. Yeah. Uh, didn't, uh, didn't the inventor take like a half of a Bisley and half of a single action army I and believe just kind of so. marry them with a little extra metal or something? I don't know the exact history yeah. on that, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that once you get one in your hand, it just makes it, your, makes your hand say, ah, oh, you yeah. know, you just get a number five in your hand and there's just hardly no feeling like Especially it. Especially in heavy recoiling cartridges, that earlier grip frame, uh, that, that gun's going to ride up on you and, it's, and yeah. it's, it's hard to hang on to. Yeah. And, it hurts. and a lot of grips that get wider toward the bottom are not comfortable. Right. We'll take a cold Python grip, you know, just a factory grip. Yeah. And, They're and kind the of tough Target to deal Smith with. Grips as well. Yeah. yeah. If your, your little finger was extended out, so you didn't have that control. Yeah. They started changing the design for double action shooting. Yeah. Right. But uh, Bowen's done those. Clements has done those. Uh, you know, replicated the number five with the the front latch and everything for the cylinder pin. Yeah. Right. And the all of a sudden, swing. people got really interested in revolvers, thinking, you know. Man, this this is a full boat thing. I can have this customized just like a rifle, yeah, like an express rifle. That's, that's right. And then you got to have a classic caliber like forty forty four special. Yeah, you want to do something at least the way I look at non standard, something right. a little a little bit different. That's what makes it you know personalized. Do you get a lot of requests for that for to change calibers? We do, uh, and and as long as it's something that's that's uh, a good legitimate. Uh, right. end result, I'm, um, I'm all for it because, you know, we all work hard for our money and when we mm -hmm. decide what we want and say maybe this builds a once in a lifetime build for a guy, we want to embrace it, let it be fun for them. Don't let it be something at the end they think, oh wow, so glad that's over. And one of the you things know? you mentioned <laughs> earlier when we were talking before we came on, uh, I didn't realize you've got, you're putting out over 200 engraved guns a year. We, we did. Last year, we put out over 200 engraved guns through wow. our facility. That's huge. It, we're, we're a small family-owned company, and we, we work with people who are good quality people, and that's another thing. You, you've just got to be able to set your own standards of what you're willing to live with and make sure that the little time I have to go lay my head on the pillow, I want to sleep good. Yeah. So... And you're still doing a lot of restoration work, right? We are. The guns that come in pails and bags. You know, they still do come in, <laughs> uh, and, and we do. And our goal is to, to restore them to where they look like they did when they left the factory. That's not to be deceitful right. or try to fool anybody, but if you're going to do it, do it right. Yeah. You know, take well, the time to hand polish around those screw heads and not cup those holes out and take the time to blend your your flats and your rounds back in and take pride in what you do you know if everybody if everybody took pride in everything they did and did their best at everything it would eliminate a lot of problems now not every gun's a candidate for full restoration obviously no no they're really not there's <coughs> just because every gun can be restored right. doesn't mean it should be restored now, I've done some restorations on guns that was grandpa's or dad's gun or something. They're no longer around. They want it to look like it was brand new. Um, and they'd get upside down on the gun. They'd have way more in it than what the gun would ever be worth. But do you have any kind of uh, criteria <coughs> to follow as far as where the cutoff is? You know, we kind of interview the client and say, you know, tell me what's on your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this gun sentimental to you? Um, and a lot of times what's is. the history behind it, it might be the only gun you know, in the family uh, and that's what I, I had this conversation with a gentleman from I think he was from Kentucky 
this week on the phone and he called in and he had a gun that was not a candidate for restoration. It was a, an inexpensive gun mm -hmm. and it was in terrible condition. I mean, it was horrible. And so the first thing he did is he said, can it be done? I said, yes, sir, it can. And I said, let's talk about it though. I said, is, is this something that uh, you, you picked up at the, at the local pawn shop or local gun store and, yeah. and you think it'd be cool to redo it? And he said, well, my, my father was killed. I was at a, you know, when I was young this is the only thing I have of his. Oh, that's a different issue. And I yeah. want it done. And I said, yeah. it's a candidate. That's right. You know? All right. And I said, it's important that you know that you've got a $200 gun that you're fixing to spend $600 on. Yep. And you're not going to have an $800 gun. It would be priceless to him. Though. But, he, and that's what he told me. He said, there's no, he said, there's no amount of money that I could put on this gun. And so customer service in this industry is so important to be able to, to go along with the customer, feel what they need, and deliver what, right. what they actually need, you know? And if that would have been a gun that he picked up at the pawn shop and he thought it'd be cool to redo, I would have talked him out of doing it. Right. I would have said, save your money, put a little more with it, go buy another one. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, and if you're honest with the customers and, and people ask these questions all the time and there's the difference of course between refinishing and restoration right big fi N big difference and, and and there are people that insist that guns should never be refinished because it detracts from value well i have a classic example here this is an old <coughs> remington um now this gun in like really really nice condition is probably two to two hundred and fifty dollars and um Good you, shooting guns normally. They too. were great shooting Very guns. Accurate. And a lot of people loved it, the 500 series <coughs> Remington. Uh, and or if you were to have this restored or even refinished, you would put much more into the gun than it's worth. Here's a gun that if you clean it up, you can still shoot it. Uh, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted and not harm the value because that's what you get. Um, and, and those are the things. And you, have to, and you have to be aware of that. If you bought it for $50 at a yard sale, there's probably a reason why it was fifty dollars. Sure. We I didn't intentionally do it, but we have the opposite laying right there. This was not a perfect brand new python that came in. This was a python that had been ridden hard and put up wet, and had very little blue, had some pitting, and I, I decided, you know what? That's a good short-barreled python. Yeah. Let's just very desirable. Let's bring it back to life. And so I bought that as about a eight or nine hundred dollar python in that barrel length, that which makes it rare alone. Which, which gives price. you a whole well. Most people would have would have seen it and probably passed over it. Um, mm -hmm. The bore was perfect. The there was no damage mechanically. The gun had been fired very little. It's as close to a brand new one of those as, as you can get internally and externally What's now. What's the barrel length on that one? That is the short barrel. Yep. Okay, so three inch barrel, more three or less. Quarter, something like that. Two and, a half. and you ha and you engraved it as well. We did. Yes, one of my in-house engravers, uh, actually Ricky wow, Sharp, nice. was the, the engraver who cut this one. And this is that this is that example. This gun was worth saving. Right. right. Uh, and you now, know. Now you got something valuable. And then you something. you have the discussion. Well, why didn't you leave it alone? It it had honest character. Well. You know, you turn a $800 gun into a $4,500 gun. Well, let's let's talk about honest character. Yeah. You know. Exactly. Right. This is just the next stage in its life. Yes. That gun is yeah. It's it, very nice. it was it was at a point in life where it was not an asset. Right. You know, and uh, and the purists and there are but will argue up and down that you should leave it alone. Okay. But you know. What if the factory does it? What if the factory reviews it? If you send it to England because it was made in England and they do it, it doesn't detract. Well, but if you if, send it to Colt, it does. Colt or Smith & Wesson. But yeah. now, if you send it, if you have a Colt factory redone and a Smith & Wesson factory redone, uh -huh. the Smith will be less impacted by the factory refinished than the Colt. It's But it's do you crazy. know what that, that strikes me funny? You know who's doing them? A good, talented gunsmith working for a company. Sure. Right. Sure. So... Uh, done properly, it doesn't matter where it's done as long as it's done by somebody who takes pride in what they're does doing it right. and does it right. Is Colt coming out with the Python again? I've heard that rumor. I don't think it's possible. 
there's nobody left at the factory that was there no, when they were making them. They'd have to learn that trick uh, all I over again. I don't know if they had yeah. anybody left that can do the polish Th like they did. They'd be better off hiring pipelines. clock makers to come in and put those things together. Yeah. Rather than gunsmiths, because that that's a whole other beast in itself. Very finicky. Right. Very, very. Yeah. There's, there's but not many places that work on them. When you pull that hammer back, it, it does it, feel like a python. It does feel different than anything else. Yeah. Even a long action smith, it's, it's different than that. All right. So I don't think they'll be doing that. And if, if they do, I haven't heard. I haven't heard uh, if they ha if if that is a rumor. It's one that I've. Of course, right. I live in my little box and I keep my head down and stay busy. But that's right. not something that I've heard. But I'm sure the collectors that paid all the money for these don't want them to come out with it anymore. They wouldn't exactly. be the same though. They would still be a well. Is that an early Python or a late oh. Python? You know, it'd be the whole new discussion of a whole nother topic. Right. Was this hand yeah. fitted like it was right. five years ago? <laughs> yeah. Is yeah. this the correct polish and the correct blue? Is this? Uh, yeah. Right. Oh, or it's one of the stainless ones toward the last. Right. The eighties guns. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think into the nineties. Yeah, okay. I think they were putting parts together, custom shop only for a while, okay. with what they had left over. I got one of those stainless. for graduation. Did you really? I did. That's a pretty decent present. It was, wow. it, and at the time it was just a a nice Colt Python, and now it's. It's in the investment side, you know. No it's kidding. in the it's in the side that it just stays there forever. I wouldn't I wouldn't take for it. It's one of those ones I was telling you that, you know, sentimental value is hard to put a price on. Sure, sure. You got so. one new in the box. I mean, yeah, heck. yeah. That's just one of those deals. Nice. But so these I've seen these prices just kind of go straight up for a while. Now they seem to have plateaued on the on the snake guns. I have seen that too, and and and. Uh, we send a lot of these out off of our website that are engraved. You know, we'll sell them, find one that's, and some of them have just a little tiny bit of holster wear. Some of them are perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, when we decide to engrave one, we do it as an investment. We, we put a certain amount into it and we make sure that, for one, the customer gets a quality product. They're not upside down in it when they get it. And when they get it home, keep it 10 years, they're gonna have done something with their investment and not right. had it in a CD. Now there are people making uh, aftermarket grips with the uh, the Colt discussion in there, so sure. you can get those now. Yep. Uh, depending on what vintage your Python depends on the finish on the grips, so they're, they're and, doing and that. And whether the checkering comes all on the first, second, right. third model, uh -huh. or whether uh, where the checkering is supposed to be yeah. and what's so the correct grip. Yeah. So you've got to be careful. Because yeah. if you don't know, if you're not, you know, an expert on pythons, and you say, "Why well, oh. don't a python?" and you get it home, and somebody said, "Oh, by the way, that's an aftermarket box that they're oh. making, and those are not the correct grips for that vintage." And so you go, "So you're to a thousand now, five hundred right. for uh, five hundred for a, for the right box when Who'd you have thought? the wrong one, and then right. five hundred for the right grips." It's just getting as complicated yeah. as collecting lugers at that point. Right, and so you have to be careful because once the money starts to to get there. Once somebody made it, somebody can reproduce it, and so people are going to start making them. Yeah. That's another issue you have to be careful with. Now, what about people who are just beginning to collect? You know, they're not going to jump in on the three thousand dollar end and buy pythons or lugers or broom handles or whatever. I just I tell them, you know what? If you're going to do this, find something you like. It, it doesn't have to be expensive. Everything's become collectible. I've noticed too. I Mose and the Gants are collectible. You can collect anything. Yeah. And I always tell the customers, figure out what you want to collect research it and learn about it because don't invest in anything that you don't know about. Right. And don't so impulse buy. A lot of those buy old military it, you know? rifles you couldn't give away years ago, now they're very collectible. Even the French yeah. ones and you know, right. all the obscure ones. It's amazing. Yeah. Somebody wants to collect everything. Yeah, it's not a money issue. It, it's, it's more of a desire thing. Yeah. If you find something you like, you learn about it and you start to look at the variations and you try to get a representative copy of of each well, one or when the Mosins were being imported in those great numbers you could you know get them for 50 bucks a copy in some cases and for 69 or 70 dollars you could get a finished 39 with the right. pistol grip stock you know made by Seiko the barrel select grades for ten dollars and more so a lot of people built up yeah. some really nice extensive collections for not a whole lot of money and I don't know that are there any opportunities like that now I don't, I'm not in that market. I mean, not just, yeah. not military surplus, but okay, is there um, anything out there that's really, you know, not that expensive to collect now, but. Remingtons are always less than Winchesters. Sure. Um, 
Marlins are less than Winchester. Marlins, early Marlins, early but Marlins but are catching up. The lever actions. Not yet, though. Early Marlins are still undervalued. Marlin lever guns are super nice guns, yeah. especially the pre-safety, the hammer safeties. Yep. If you look at, uh, you know, the solid frame, the action is much smoother. Uh, it's a much stronger oh, gun. The square bolt guns. I got yeah. one of those uh, Marlin Model 81s in the other day, in 4570 mm -hmm. marked 45 Gov. Oh. It's like a three or four digit serial number gun. Yep. And you go to thinking about that versus if that was a 76 Winchester, there's no comparison on right. those. You know, it's None. Right. And, and you have to be careful because if you look at the blue book, if you look at the original 39, not the 39A, and you look at the 1898s and oh. some of these early lever guns, the blue book puts them at extremely high values. Yes, they, they do. don't bring that kind of money. Uh, so you really have an opportunity in Marlins. And... It's like with Smith and Wessons. When the, when the snake guns got really expensive, it drew the Smith and Wessons up because people would wouldn't buy the Python because it was too expensive, but they would buy the Smith. The right. same with Marlins. People are looking and saying, "Wow, some of those Winchesters are really expensive. Uh, I don't want to spend that kind of money, yeah. but I can get a really nice Marlin over here for a whole lot less." And uh, so that's a good market. And Marlin made really nice guns. They did. No. Very nicely machined. Then you get those weird collectors like me that's in it for the chase. I enjoy finding, pursuing, and bringing this fine home. Right. And then, you know, I might start having fall out of love after a while, <laughs> and I get to wanting to go, go find a new, uh, a new chase and, and chase it again. And so I may be the exception on, you know, piling them up. But I know I think... I think we all have that in us a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I think if you look in the in the back room where they're in a pile somewhere, it's like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, my wife will say to that me, "That was last year's yeah. thing." You know, what, sure. what are all yeah. of those? What are yeah. you doing with those? Ah, that that's just my stuff. Right. Well, like if you right. want to get into single action Rugers, uh, you know, the Blackhawks, you can get them on the used market fairly reasonably in a, in a variety of calibers. Yes. Plus you can. the convertible guns with two cylinders. Right. Then then there's there's organizations that are set up to promote Ruger collecting, Colt, you know, and so yep. that's another place yep. to find, you know, I know of one just because I'm uh, involved in the Ruger industry as much as I am, uh, the, the Ruger Collectors Association, sure. you yep. know, uh, they, I think they call it ROCS, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a organization set up for educating and building the future of Ruger collectors. They have some nice displays at the gun shows at and at like the NRA Tulsa, convention. Yeah, yeah. And yeah they, they really yeah. put on a nice display. Yeah, they display. really do. And they're a great source of information yeah. because many of these people have studied these products for years and they'll know every little thing that you never would have even thought. Plus, uh, I've got the other products that Ruger made a lot of times. They display those, all the tools and stuff Ruger used to make. Yeah. They, they really did a lot of stuff. The drill. Yeah. 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 You know. Every, everything. Yeah, uh, yeah. Smith & Wesson Forum is another one, a collector's yeah. association. Right. That's a good uh, one. Th there is so many things that really weren't cataloged and just, you know, small lots were made and there's really no record of it. it but somebody out there will know. And they will know in detail. Yeah. And they'll, uh, I just bought a, a, a Smith & Wesson with an, with an unusual barrel length, not cataloged. And uh, I went to the forum, and, and they had the whole thing written in, in a long article. Um, so it's nice to find out, especially when you find something that's unusual. And or, or if you didn't realize it when you bought it, you say, oh, it's a nice little gun. I think I'll buy it. And then you get it home, and you're like, wow, this is really special. That's always fun. Yeah, you get on the, the Ruger Forum or the Smith & Wesson Forum, and you'll, you'll get on there some evening and, you know, look mm -hmm. up four hours later, <laughs> right. you know. You've I've learned there, a lot that. about, right. uh, you know, yep. very, you know, different products and different manufacturers and how many they made in that barrel length and the things that you need to educate yourself when you do go to the gun show, when you walk by and see it and you say, wow, that's a seven and a half inch barrel. Right. They didn't make very many in that length. They you get know? some really good discussions going yeah. when somebody brings something back from a gun show and puts a photo of it and say, what have I got here? And then the discussion right. starts, does it have this, 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 and this, and, you know, on it goes, and you, you get, kind of get that detective process going. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you learn a lot. And it, it just when you think that you pretty, have, pretty much have a subject nailed down, you'll find somebody Turn the that, page. Yeah, you'll yeah. find somebody yeah. that, that'll just, you'll just That's blow right. you out of the water. Sure. Because he's, you know, he's been doing it for 50 years, and he knows everything there is to know about that specific gun. Yeah. You both doing general gunsmithing still? We are doing general gunsmithing uh, with an emphasis on metal refinishing. Okay. Uh, Some mechanical work as we, needed. We do, and 
uh, we're doing a lot of the custom builds on the revolvers. Uh, right. We're doing custom rifle builds just because it's just basic machining. Well, if you're, uh, if you're restoring, you must do some welding and things like that, we, too. We do weld up holes, uh, Which edges, is an corners. Uh, and then and then the hard part is blending it back, making it oh, right. I can imagine. You know, and putting the, pr the correct finish back on or figuring out what the finish needs to be. Don't you have to kind of you know, know what the gun's made out of originally to, to make well, it work? Well, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's an understatement, I'll bet. We were speaking earlier of uh, welding up holes in guns. When you, buy a, when you buy a gun and it needs a little bit of work, and this is a Savage 99, and I don't know if you can see this. Can you see that, Matt? Uh, you'll see that somebody uh, got a drill for Christmas and, uh, and a set of taps, and uh, we have about, I don't know, one, Roll. two, three, four, five, about seven or eight additional holes, and, and that does kind of detract from value. And uh, you need to plug those holes. They need to be welded with the right material, repolished, re-blued, and it has to come out looking like it's supposed to. And, and we, had, we were talking of that earlier. Um, the other alternative is, is we can take weld those up individually, back it back out, and there's times where matching the bluing can be hard, especially with, that. that's now a stripe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so we do the color case finish, and some of these were originally colored to start with. Probably not this old, but some of these, uh, there, were the, there were some of these that were color cased from the factory. And you've had, you've had good results with the color and after being welded? We can match that to where I, I sometimes forget where the hole was. Oh, so good. you could where make it better than new almost then. So that's the point. I so mean, depending on your your ninety nine, which uh, which model it is, and how how valuable it is, this might be something where you would say, okay, this is worth investing some money in. If it's if it's not if it if it's not real valuable, you might just put some filler screws in there, clean it up, and just use it to hunt in the woods. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it just depends. And those are, those are some of the things you talk about when, you know. Yeah, you really don't want to stick a lot of money restoring it if you're going to go back out in the snow and the slush. and, and climb Unless you're like me, if, if I fall down a mountain and I have my gun, <laughs> I may break every bone in my body, but I'm going to keep that gun up. Yep. I'm, I'm that guy. Whoever inherits it will appreciate it. They that. will. They <laughs> will. My kids will be, will be thrilled someday. Yeah, Dad, uh, yeah. while you're sitting in that chair, can't yeah. move. We're going to take your gun yeah, and go hunt. By yeah. the way, we're uh, taking questions, so if you have any questions for these guys or for me, just let us know. We'll uh, get you in here. So uh, what stuff you hate to work on? You know, when that project comes in the door and you look at it and think, my gut told me I should have said no. Yep. That's the, that's really, that's my biggest thing. I mean, without and, calling out know, a particular manufacturer or anything, there are just certain types of guns. Like, I, I try to stay away from semi-automatic 22s that aren't working when they come in the door. My, my criteria is quality. If it was built quality uh -huh. and they did it right to start with, then it can be repaired and be just as good as it was. If it left the factory as junk, it's still junk. Yeah. And after I fix it, it's still going to be junk. And that's just... You know, it's just the fact of life, you know? That's right. The same with refinishing. If it was quality with a nice finish when it left, right. then you oh can get boy. that nice finish back. But if, you, <laughs> if, if they sent out a gun in, from the factory that was 120 grit polish, and it's never going to look good. And you'll end up putting more work into it sure. because by the time you get done, it'll be better than when it left the factory. It yeah. won't be original, but it'll be better. So here's that phone call. <laughs> so I've got this gun and it, I want to have it refinished and it, it doesn't have much rust, just a couple of pits here and there. Uh. They, they, they'll come out real easy and uh, the, the finish isn't too bad and, and there's not too much cracking in the grip, you know. <laughs> and so w when you get that project in and you look at it and you think, well, yeah. I've got about eight hours worth of hand polish work here, you know. Right. Those are That's the kind of cheap. projects that, and, and at that point, you just call the customer and say, hey, let's, let's talk about this, because these couple of pits that weren't very deep, yep. once I removed the bluing, not only did I see them, but now I see about 40 other ones that are deep, yep. and so are those. And, you know, you just, at that point, it, it may be worth it to them. And if it is, you do it, and if it's not, you, you, be, you be honest, and don't be afraid to say no or I don't know. That are the two things that in our shop, you've got to be able to say, 
no, that's not a good idea, or say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that question. I say that a lot. And instead of me <laughs> telling lot. you something you want to hear, I'm just right. going to say I don't know. Right. And but I can find. I'll try to find out. And, that's and, the other and side. And sometimes of it, you, you, know? you recommend to somebody. Here's what I would do. If this were my gun, this is what I would do. I would do, I would do this, and and, and it, it'll will clean it up. It'll make it look good. It'll function good. You can use it, and yeah. it won't be expensive. Uh, but you know, when you start draw filing, and, and folks, if you've never had to draw file on a round object, is a is a technique, and you have to do it correctly so you don't create a swale in the surface of the metal. Yep. Uh, and some of these pits are twenty or thirty thousand steep. And when you start to do that, and now after it's all polished and you look at a nice, the higher the polish, the more these defects will show. And you look at it and you say, well, why is this dip in the surface? Well, because you didn't blend it properly. And, and these, are, these are things that people don't realize when they send you this stuff. They don't understand. Right. And you say, you know what, if, I, if this was what I was going to do, I, you know what, I might just uh, clean this up or maybe do a, uh, a matte finish, non-reflective. It'll look good and it'll be a nice usable gun and it'll protect the surface and it'll, it'll give you something, and it'll work. Yeah. Uh, because not everything, is, not everything is worth the time and the investment to, you know, to, right. to do that. I've got somebody here wanting to know if top break uh, revolvers are worth restoring. Well, if that it's is a, a Webley-Fosbury we SME yeah. automatic, yeah, is definitely. It, is it a uh, early Smith & Wesson number three or Schofield? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or is it an R22? Yeah. Or is it one of the many knockoff? Keep, keep in mind that that's a weak point. Right. No, no, no way to argue that. That is a weak point. Low pressure rounds only. But it's, it's let's talk about frame. the other side of that again. Was it built? Out of uh, was it quality right. built or was it low production built? And it's already served a purpose for three generations for the price of one. That's the problem. A lot of times the internals are just worn out on those things. Yeah. And, and if you try to find them, if you have an old inexpensive, inexpensive top mm -hmm. break, let's say that, something that was made 32 Smith & Wesson, 22, 38 Smith & Wesson, all low pressure rounds, they were made for 3 to $5, you know, turn of the century, and not this century, the one before. Right. And the, the nickel has peeled off, the parts inside are soft, so now you look at it and you say, well, I need more parts. Well, I'm going to go to a parts store. The parts you're going to get are used. Sure. Probably the reason you're going to get those parts is because the gun it came out of was no good either. So you don't know if you're getting and, and uh, you know, welding up those parts and trying to refile them and harden them. Oh, uh, some of those guns are made out of steel and some are made out of whatever. Right. Yeah, it's pot not, metal. Not yeah. possible. Yeah. It'll j they'll melt away or then you finally get them fixed and you send them back out. I, I did one. Uh, ten years ago, for uh, uh, for a guy, he had it, one of those. He had it forever and ever, and he wanted it. And uh, I, he talked me into it. <laughs> I didn't want to do Wall it. Wall hangers make good decoration. They do. <laughs> shadow shadow boxes, you know? folks. Really? Shadow boxes yeah. are really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I did to him, and I and I fixed it for him, and I said, "Here's the deal." He said, "What do you owe me?" I said, "Nothing. Promise me you'll never send it back to me again. <clears throat> Don't shoot yeah. it. It works. But if you take it out and shoot a hundred rounds." is a possibility it'll break again. And now you're going to want me to fix it again because you're going to think that I didn't fix it properly, where in fact it's, it's just a quality. Sure. But yeah. a quality top break, um, like you said, a, a Schofield or something like that, mm -hmm. that's a different issue. Sure. Um, but if it's a $50 gun, there's yeah. a reason it's $50. And there were some 22s that were actually nice, like a sealed eight or something like that. Those were actually really nice guns. That's and why they yeah. got used so much. And H&R made they made the top breaks way up into the 70s, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. And, and some of those, long. you know, as long as you fire, uh, and here's the a, here's a thing that people have problems with. They think ammunition, if it says the caliber on it, it's good to go. But those early guns were not made for the high pressures of today's 22 ammunition. You want to stick with standard velocity. Yeah, which or, is easy to find. Or longs, yeah. or just longs or shorts, because yeah. if you start to put, you know, mini mags and stingers and yellow jackets, they're going to break. Uh, you know, yeah. and a lot of the lever actions as well, the early lever guns. So that's a problem. But I fix the gun for you, and you understand that. You, after a year or two, sell it, and the person you sell it to doesn't understand it. Now they that's put exactly right, and then sure. it's then it's an issue. But yeah. if you just want it to look pretty, <coughs> it's just it's just another restoration right. job. It goes by the hour, you know, yeah. whatever it takes right. to get it back. Some of those guns I won't take apart. You know, the ones with a little wire spring in front of the hand. Why yes. don't they work when you take them apart and put it back together? 
<coughs> what what makes that happen? If you don't touch the trigger group from the time you take it out to you put yeah. it in, why do they just stop working? Because you didn't hold your mouth sideways when you put it back in. And or sometimes you know you'll you know you can do it and it'll do it, bam, it's fixed. And other times you'll take it apart and put it back together and take it apart and put it back together and you'll have four hours taking it apart and put and you'll get frustrated. Yeah. But you can't charge the customer four hours yeah. of labor for a job well, you can try once right. but <laughs> you can't charge them that money for a, a job that should be legitimately an hour or less yeah and one thing to keep in mind the gunsmithing profession is just like anything else it, it, it just because we love it it's still a viable job and it has to, it, and it you have to get paid for what you do. Oh, somebody's got a uh, new Smith 586 you'd like to have some custom work done on. Where should he go to get work done? 586 brand new. So on a new one. Yeah. You're up, Bob. Unmolested. You know, I'll tell you what, we've, uh, as far as action stuff on those, and I'm even going to go as far as saying that there's, there's certain factory things that come on those that sometimes can go away that, that aren't quite as desirable. Um, We've, we've cut some of those back, did some front sight modifications. Mm -hmm. There's so many things you can do with those. Those, the 586 is one of those guns that you can, you can do a little bit of custom work to mm -hmm. and not break the bank. And when you get to the range or get out in the woods, it's gonna work so comfortably that instead of fiddling around and trying to figure out you know, different things with the gun, you're gonna be shooting, enjoying yourself, and finish the job before you even the new the new ones the MIMS parts guns mm -hmm. and, and, and for you folks that don't know about the MIMS parts are they're metal injected molded pieces compared to the machine cut steel case hardened of the earlier guns and there's a lot of talk today where people like to call gunsmiths part changers and they're not really gunsmiths because sure. but a lot of the new stuff today is not meant to be gunsmith like old stuff so there's limited things you can do like I said you can improve them you, you can Smooth areas. Uh, I found sometimes putting just a, a spring kit in will do all. Spring kit. Do. Uh, that's cheap. It'll never feel like a Model 27. No, it, it no. won't. It won't. Um, it never will. Looking at uh, uh, Sig, like their classic line, like their 229s, 220s, you can do action jobs, but you are limited by the design of the gun. You're limited by what you can do. So there are some things you can do. Um, burr, removing of burrs and rough spots on all your parts and pieces. But you have to be careful. You know, you have to be judicious. Uh, Dremel tools are probably uh, your worst oh. enemy at that at that point. Well, see, you uh, don't just go in and polish all of the part. You correct. only polish the areas that need to be That's polished correct. to keep from damaging correct. the gun as it's it, being it used. It doesn't take much polishing either. Right. No, no, very little. Uh, proper lubrication, uh, that's yep. a big issue as well. Uh, and, and these are things, uh, you know, uh, I, I had a, when I was teaching a class one time, I had a student in class and and we were teaching a, a Sig Sauer class, which is a double action, single action, you know, 226s, 229s. Um, and he came in with an, with an H and K, and it was a single act, it was a double action single, and he said, I want this to work like a 1911. I said, well that's, well, that's like buying an automatic and saying, where's the clutch and the stick shift? Right. I mean, you right. know, you, you gotta start out with the right foundation, so there's certain things you're not gonna do, you're just not. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah, so y you do a lot of work on the 586s? We do. There you uh, go. This we do. This is the answer I right there. I think they're great yeah. guns. I got two of them. Yeah. Oh, the two L-Frame. Brand, is two brand yeah. new ones. When, they, when the L-Frame came out in 82, yeah. I was ecstatic. I mean, yeah. that was... That doesn't mean if you've got one with a hammer nose, I won't buy it, because right. I will buy it. Yeah. You know, it's a quality gun. Yeah. And just like, you know, we've talked about the whole time, anything you start with with quality, you can make it into something right. yeah. better. If I want to shoot magnets you know? through that thing, it's not going to hurt it. To get out there and get it done. Yeah, that's like exactly an old 19 right. or something where you want to be a little careful. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, the new 19 supposedly has different heat treating, and you can shoot a lot more full uh, length, uh, strength magnums through it. That's interesting. That's yeah. that's a good. That's I, I just read that recently. I can't huh. quote you the source because I don't remember where I read it, but that was very interesting. And they've got all that technology to do that. I mean, when you look at that Model 69, the five shot 44 magnum on mm -hmm. the L frame. They're doing it. Yeah. That that cylinder isn't any bigger. So that's something else. I wouldn't like to shoot that gun a whole lot. But yeah. Any uh, any last comments? Any uh, anything you see happening in the industry that's noteworthy? 
uh, things go up and down. And, uh, you know, what's popular today is not tomorrow, and what isn't popular becomes popular. Sure. I uh, mean, uh, like, like ARs are in a little bit of a slump right now, And and, I, and like I said, I'm more of a, of, of, of a classic line of stuff, so I don't really pay attention to that market. Um, but I know that from the people I see at the shows, they're saying that that market is way down. I've seen a lot of younger faces at gun shows looking at things other than ARs and plastic pistols now. Yeah. Um, they're looking at revolvers and lever actions and well, military. There was, there was a thought I was going to I was going to talk about. Uh, I've been hearing for the last couple of years where everybody talks about well these guns that they have today. Nobody likes these old guns. These kids today want plastic. They don't like old guns. And I said, well, they like what's popular. They're kids, and you know they they see what's on TV and and they think it's neat. But when people start to develop a taste and they and they start to they get older and they're making more money and they're looking to invest right. and looking for nice things they always go back to the nice things of quality sure. and that's why winchester has been around and remington and all colt that's why these guns today are still you know they haven't made the python in forever but look they're still there's still a lot of money that's right. and cream, cream rises to the top always does you know it does. really does so you folks out there that are looking to start or or, or kind of pick an area it's open. You can pick whatever you'd like. Pick your own financial market brand. and just do it. A good brand and a proven design. Right. And learn. Read. Yeah. Call Steve. Yeah. He'll yeah. answer your question. <laughs> Call Steve. Well, guys, thanks a lot. This has been great. We'll thanks for having me. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And, uh, maybe all three of us will be on the cover one year. Oh. I don't know how good <laughs> that. I don't know. <laughs> thanks very much for watching and thanks for your questions. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.